with some review. Um, today, I just want to reprise a little with uh, Judith Leister and then the other Dutch 17th, early 18th century painter that I mentioned. And then we will begin, Georgia O'Keeffe, don't panic. I will not panic. I expect we will be doing Georgia O'Keeffe again next time because we will just take her in a stately fashion. But uh, when I, I, I brought these few in from um, Judith Loyster to uh, the, a couple of examples that spanned her career, I was um, thinking about um, one, I wanted to frame this in terms of how different the art market was from the other women we've looked at because Judith Loyster has to um, appeal to a commercial market. And with her fluency as an artist, she really changes her subject matter and the style and the way she works. Then you have that whole problem that in their years of marriage and child rearing and taking care of her husband's business, it's quite likely she did not do very many paintings. I think it's a, a marvelous statement about her quality that works by her, it turns out to be, were always given to Franz Hals because he was the preeminent artist of the time. Well, maybe that means more paintings are given to him, but it means that, that she was as adept in the same kind of style as she had here in her um, self-portrait. But just to see how different, I know I didn't, I think I just, I think this is such a weird painting. I, I skimmed right by it last time. This called a boy and a girl with a cat and an eel. I mean, what in the world? So here he is with this squir squirming eel here. She looks extraordinarily ancient for her size. And then this boy with this cat, the cat, as you can see, is really rebellious and about to revolt. It has its claws extended. This is a, there's a Dutch proverb that um, he who plays with cats has to prepare to be scratched. So this is that kind of like homey, cozy adage that was sort of led daily life. So um, people would have this pictures like this even in their kitchen or scattered around the house. So, so she's working in that, to that, um, for that kind of audience. And the one that I just we glanced at and passed by last time is this one called the proposition. <clears throat> um, it's um, in the Moritz Huys. And it's a small, I think it's about a foot and a half high, this painting. You think of this in the context of works like, well, Vermeer or, or other Dutch 17th century painters of just simple domestic scenes, as you see a woman here uh, working on her embroidery, completely intent on it. Her, it must be cool there, her feet are on a warmer down here. That's what that little bit of light is. So it's a toasty fall or winter day in the dusk of the room. And this man, and you know it's chilly, he's got this fur cap on. <clears throat> but it wouldn't probably be because it's so cold as much as is that he's come in from outside because you see he has a handful of coins. So what the precise message is here is not exactly clear, but it looks like he's, it's called the proposal, but it's really called the proposition that he's um, so whether she's meant to be a prostitute or just a simple maid who makes money on the side by selling her body, that's certainly the theme of this as he looms over her. And she, you see the drama of her utterly impassive unreaction to this. So that has some uh, human content in it. And then this doesn't look at all 
like her figure oil paintings and none of that dash and splash and the loose brushwork of the Franz Hall style. Uh, and this is just called a still life with a basket of fruit. And it's from around 1635 or 40 when she's married. Uh, evidently there's somewhere up in here, her name is written. So it's been, um, not only does that validate it, there are other paintings by her husband that have the same blue cloth on the table. <clears throat> so this is appealing to a different taste. These, these luxury goods, the fine life that um, Dutch, especially maritime commerce is making possible. Um, and looking at the gleams here of the, I think those are meant to be quince rather than apples. Maybe those are apples. Certainly apples here and grapes in the um, nicely filled cup of wine here and the bloom still on the grapes. So it's just uh, very appealing. You know, still lifes like this ultimately go back to Caravaggio and some artists in, in uh, Milan, but uh, they really were fashionable in Holland in the 17th century. Or this we saw that she did for a, a book of um, prints of flowers of the, um, flower from which all of Holland was rabid in the 1930s, the um, tulips. And this is a particular, so it's a botanical drawing of a specific kind of tulip. And it was thought that, whoa, well, they knew why she was doing these because a, a watercolor wouldn't take all the apparatus. You wouldn't have to have the setup. You don't have oils that take a long time to dry. She didn't need the studio space. She didn't have to worry about kids getting into it. She could do a small, modest piece like this and essentially keep her hand in and still be bringing in family income. And then more recently, there was discovered this, and it's been well authenticated for whatever authentication means, um, this uh, still life and it's signed with her name and it's signed with her married name rather than, than the monogram she used when she was single. Um, and this is the other type of subject matter, which was of immense popularity in Holland in the 17th century. And that's these flower paintings, <clears throat> which again, doesn't, doesn't even look like the fruit painting. So she was a good artist and she was able to bend with the breezes. And I hope they do find more by her. And now we go on to Rachel Roish who is um, totally a flower painter. You see, she has a remarkably long life. And she was painting up till the time she was 83, at least. Here's a portrait of her. Uh, let me just tell you what someone said about this, uh, or her, and then I'll tell you a little about her. Um, Someone visiting her said, what do you say? So she's, she's, uh, that she was cultured, but not very pretty. <clears throat> but she was certainly cultured. Her father was a professor of botany and anatomy. And he was invited to teach at the university in Amsterdam so that her family moved from The Hague to Amsterdam. Her father was um, famed for having discovered some new way to embalm so that um, whatever he embalmed still looked lifelike. And that was such a solace for families who had so many children die in, in, in infancy in their early years that they could still have a, a um, departing image of, of their child. But <clears throat> He, he was a, a great scientist. He was very interesting. He worked in botanical gardens. He taught botany. He taught anatomy. Um, he collected specimens of all kinds and he involved them. So he had essentially cabinets of curiosities, of bugs, stones, shells, flowers, body parts. And um, so, and then he would make drawings of them, very fine drawings of them. So that's her father's side of the family, her mother's side of the family, her, 
her maternal grandfather was a fine architect and a painter. And his brother, I actually encourage you to look at his art, a man named Franz Post, just feel like a doorpost, who had accompanied a Dutch expedition to Brazil. And he stayed for several years um, doing paintings of the exotic landscapes and all the flowers there. So there, there's a talent and visual interest and a side of scientific curiosity on both sides of the family. And Rachel, even as a child, especially liked to work with her father. I, I'm gonna recommend something. I hope maybe someone in the class has been to Philadelphia to the Mutter Museum, M-U-T-T-E-R. It's a fascinating and really disconcerting museum of all sorts of um, medical curiosities. Yeah, uh, a lot about tattooing, about, uh, oh, there was something with someone with a distended colon. There are lots of embalmed body parts. Oh, just a huge range of things. That's a, sort of expressing that pre-modern medical illustration way of knowing about parts of the body. <clears throat> and I was going through there with my son and there's Rachel Roish's name. Well, she used to help her father. Her father would make these kind of like dioramas. The one described to me, I don't remember the one I saw, the one that was described as it. He had embalmed some fetuses and then he put them with um, some large um, gallstones and kidney stones and made a kind of a little landscape around them. And she used to make lace or little embroideries to, to um, make the settings more, more attractive. So, and she, she went to help her father with the specimens. So she, early on when she was 14, her parents um, decided that she could um, apprentice by this time, a bona fide apprenticeship with the leading uh, still life painter in, in Amsterdam. I'm gonna give you two more portraits of her, I think. This one from an engraving of her, uh, she was of considerable age with her um, paintings propped outside. And this is a, a sure marker of the fact that she was famous, that there was a desire uh, for there to be engraving so that people distant could, could know what, what luminaries looked like. And so there was this one of her, you see with her. And she, she won, she worked, um, she had a court position later on for the Elector Palatine of Bavaria and that's a medal she got there. Or when she was 29, she married a man, um, Urien Poole, who was also a painter. And the, the well, I'd say he's an equivalent of a governor of, of Bavaria, had asked for a portrait of Rachel Roish, of Urien. And he, what he did was uh, just get this, would you? Um, he, he, instead of doing only a portrait of his wife, he made it a family portrait and who's at the apex of the triangle. <clears throat> but uh, here she is with one of her still lives. This is one of their many children uh, who had been appointed, made the godson of the governor of Bavaria and he'd been given a medal. So this is like a kind of a memorial of that. But that's an indication of the kind of prestige in which she was held with the, it, that there was a desire for this full portrait of her. So someone visiting her, uh, which was well along in her career, said, we saw two paintings by her, one flowers and one still life in the studio. And then she was surrounded by birds nests and flowers and insects of all kinds. And she was getting ready to work on a commission for the Grand Duke of Tuscany. Tuscany. Each painting, which costs several times the annual salary of an average worker. She made a fortune as a painter and people across Europe queued. Uh, she had a waiting list over years to have one of her paintings. So that's why I say she just far outshone Rembrandt. 
Now here's a painting by her teacher, just to give you the idea of the, what these floral paintings looked like. Um, they were no more simple, beautiful, beguiling, intricate, realistic portrayals of flowers um, than a scene of children playing just meant children playing. There was generally still the belief that paintings had to have meaning. They were not sheer decoration or they certainly were not self-expression yet. And in this one, the blue ribbon is attached to a watch here. Here you see the open case. I'm told that somewhere the key for winding it up is in there somewhere. So it, oh, I think that's here. It's dangling from the, the sort of sash, a ribbon. So that's, that's all it takes to be an indication that this is a, a vanitas painting. It's about um, uh, the, the message is life is fleeting, time passes, the flowers die, and there will often be some flowers that die. Insects eat them. Insects themselves have remarkably brief lifespans. So enjoy the beauty, savor it, and know how fleeting it is. And all these paintings are always against a dark background like that. She also studied with a man who specialized in doing them as if they were on forest landscape backgrounds. So there's a little bit of a setting rather than just solid black. <clears throat> There's an artist, in fact, known for doing some flowers seen from the back. And um, they're not always flowers that are in season simultaneously. Now, in her desire to be meticulously realistic with these, as she is in, this one is by Rachel Roish, when she's about 19. And it's, it's a little bit blurry slide. You can imagine this is, this is like, in, I think you could take a, magnifying glass to this and you would still not see brushwork. It's so finely done. Uh, <clears throat> her desire for the same kind of exactitude that is characteristic of her father's scientific researches into uh, human body and nature would be when there were mosses shown in the ground down here. She would sometimes take sponges and dip them in paint and then apply them to the surface or sometimes take real mosses and dip them in paint and apply them to the surfaces so that she would get the structure, the alternation of darks and lights, absolutely accurate. And the flowers she presented could be not only from different seasons, but she's making use of her, her father's wonderful collection of embalmed flowers and his collection of insects as well. This is just a close-up of one of her works. I think you have a sense of why there might be such a lineup of people wanting something by her. But, um, now you could think of like photorealist works, but of course this is done before there's anything that gave you that kind of precision that photorealism does because it's <laughs> based on photography. So this is very, very close scrutiny and a wonderful study of the shifts of colors. And you see a little creature beginning to nibble here, a larger one here. So these were paintings that invited intensely close looking and uh, in a setting, a sort of a social gathering in a house, you can imagine people gathering around it and commenting on it. So it would be a, it would spur conversation and reflection and just general appreciation. It's a magnificent peony, isn't it? And this one is a, just a, <laughs> there's no specific title for almost any of these. This one I believe is just simply called um, Still Life in a Glass Maze. And this is in the Rijksmuseum. It's half high. 
So imagine getting that precision <laughs> down to something that small. I mean, it, it, it so exceeds anything I can imagine. But I want to talk about um, the what's here now. Because she is using preserved specimens, or many flower painters did, <clears throat> or they could use botanical drawings. They, they could assemble uh, plants that bloom at different times of year. So these are not meant to be your casual arrangement that you could go out in your garden or to your florist and get. Not only that, but this is one that also has a quasi-religious meaning, uh, something certainly for religious contemplation. Because the top flower here as in several of hers, is an iris. Now the iris has a long-standing Christian symbolism. In earlier Flemish paintings, say, of the Annunciation or um, lots of scenes with Mary and, and um, the Christ child, there'll be an iris near Mary because the long tapering leaves of iris we thought sort of symbolize swords, like that's the pain that she's going to suffer with the death of her son. And there's another Christian meaning given to the iris because it's three drooping petals here would take to represent the Trinity. And that also explains, other than the fact that it's very nice at the top of the composition, it's a dramatic crest to it, Trinity is often at the top in religious paintings. Say, a last judgment, lots of this God up there, and the dove of the Holy Spirit, and then maybe Jesus just down a little below that. So that's a very oblique, but by the Dutch understandable, the Protestant Dutch reference um, to the Trinity. And then this morning glory, and this is a poppy, a white poppy. This refers to D Jesus's death and resurrection. The poppy is associated with death, evidently, and the white, like the white winding sheet. And the morning glory closes at night and opens at the first rays of the sun in the morning. So that's, that's this is the death of Christ and here's his resurrection. Now, I don't know if every flower in here has a meaning like that, um, but I'm, I'm sure some of the others do. So you see the meaning of the flowers is very different from what we now, you know, you can get a book on flower symbolism and it's more about states of mind or personalities, but not these uh, specific kind of cultural references. But so that's sort of, um, well, it, it gave, extra luster and legitimacy to this kind of subject. Here's the one she did about not such a good color reproduction. It's hard to get good reproductions because they are against this dark background. But you see, she's reusing things. There's again, and here. And sometimes you can even trace she's using the same flower from her father's collection from one to the next. This one's probably, I think this one's dated 1711. And there are various, here's a little, I, don't, I guess it's toad probably, right? And she shows sometimes they have a whole array of different kinds of butterflies in them. Or, but the only real stylistic change that comes is that uh, later on, she'll start using a light colored background because some other younger artists did. But her popularity endured. And here's one of the more uncommon fruit arrangements she made. I suppose is the quail eggs. Look, look what's going on up here. So there's a lot of life being lived and died in these things. Lovely peach with a fly on it. 
So that is the most, if you think of money as a sign of success, you know, go into a real American mode, this is the most successful of the women artists we've looked at. Now we'll go on to George O'Keefe. And I thought, oh, Margaret, aren't you clever? You went from one flower painter to the next. Although today, I don't even know if we're going to get as far as really into her flowers. But uh, we'll just uh, launch. Um, George O'Keefe is, uh, you know, if you, if you have to have like a one liner about her, uh, is considered one of the first American modernists and certainly the first American female modernist painters. Um, she was, as you can see, um, a woman who lived a very long time, actually she was 98 when she died. I don't, since I can't see you, I don't know, but I'm sure there are people here who have visited her, the ghost ranch, um, been to Abiquiu, New Mexico, have seen the areas that, where she loved to paint. Um, I also have this seeking suspicion. There are some of you more expert in her work than I am, but we'll, we'll just, I'll just plug along here. I'm myself somewhat even enjoying the fact that she's born in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. That's not far from Madison. When you think of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, born in Spring, um, Spring Green, uh, Wisconsin, that's just the names of Wisconsin towns. Uh, later on in, in her life, in fact, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright invited, invited her to, to come in and work with him in, in Wisconsin at, at Taliesin, but she said the Midwest didn't agree with her. But um, she, uh, well, we do a little of her life history, but um, she knew when she was, from the time she, well, why, why don't we, I, you know, why don't just look at her name, except you remember it's spelled with two Fs. We'll look at this very famous <clears throat> photograph of her by Alfred Stieglitz. And this is done around 1918. She knew from the time she was a child that she wanted to be an artist. Supposedly, she grew up on a farm and a, a school teacher boarded with her family and the school teacher was giving her art lessons. And she, she just, had that calling. And she early on evidently knew, at least as later she talks about herself, that the, she knew she had in her something she wanted to paint that was different from anything she'd ever seen. But uh, her parents were, were amenable to her going to art school. Uh, she studied briefly at the Art Institute in Chicago. Then she studied the our uh, Students League in uh, New York. Um, she went to University of Virginia, did, did a little art there, and then had some further longer art education at Columbia University Teachers, educate, um, Teachers College education. That's where she meant a teacher really inspired and changed her work. Uh, we'll come back to that. So she had a kind of a peripatetic training so coming in from all sorts of sources. And then she also had a quite varied early career as a fledgling artist. Uh, for a while, she, because of uh, financial constraints in the family, had to stop her study of art and she worked as a commercial artist in Chicago for a couple of years. But then to help a professor at UVA, she had to have some teaching experience. And all told, she taught in elementary school, high school, and college. And she taught in Virginia, Georgia, and Texas. Um, all this by the time she's in her mid-20s. So she has a very, very background. So I'm going to show you the, the earliest works in a moment, because as a historian, you know, you always, I always have to go back to the beginnings of things. But uh, <clears throat> taking the story after she's, she's done all this traveling, she's, she suffered in the pandemic. Um, she sometimes had very serious illnesses that sidelined her for a while. Uh, 
But uh, while she was teaching, she, uh, after she had been um, learning and guided by a professor at um, Teachers College named Dow, Arthur Dow, she began to work in a new way that's just really very abstract. And a friend of hers got a hold of those drawings and gave them to Alfred Stieglitz, who is the author of this photograph. And the, I think it's unlikely to think either Stieglitz or O'Keefe would have had the careers they did if it weren't for their complicated close connection over the years. <clears throat> so anyway, some friend of hers sent these abstract drawings she was doing to Stieglitz, who had a little gallery in New York called um, 291, because that was his address on Fifth Avenue. Uh, he was completely blown away by them. So he invited her to come up to, and then essentially he said he would guarantee her an income. And soon he left his wife and 1924, he married um, Georgia O'Keeffe. And he um, showed her work every year and he tirelessly advocated for her. And we're gonna see the kind of complications that presents. Well, um, only a few years after their marriage and uh, it must be partly just because of their characters as well as their quality of their interactions. Uh, <clears throat> Georgia O'Keeffe began to travel and uh, she traveled out to the West. So from about 1929 on, she started going to New Mexico for a couple months a year. Would paint, paint up a storm, bring them back. Stieglitz would show them. Um, then again, she would go out and come back and go back. And then after he died, she settled permanently in New Mexico. So her career goes largely New York, then New Mexico in her settled life. Let's look at some of Stieglitz photographs. Now, some I did not bring in. I'm thinking you might be familiar with them. I knew I didn't feel comfortable when they might appear on TV because he did a number of nude photographs of her. They're really gorgeous. They're just oh, well, there they are later in life. He's um, almost a quarter century older than her. Maggie, in the in the previous picture, was was that a Chagall on the wall? He's so I don't think it's a Chagall, but I'm like, oh shoot, I didn't know. I don't know. I don't think it's a Marin, but because he he's he's pushes American art later in his career, so I think that has to be an American. I'd say it's it's from the twenties. At the right time, and maybe I'll figure it out before next next class. Maybe. Thank you. Yeah. So the first one I showed you and that one and this one, they're all from the same time. Here she is in, one, in front of one of her drawings, her charcoal drawings. Over a span of more than 10 years, he did a, a big portfolio of photographs. He was an, an avant-garde photographer and, and um, he did the whole series on her. And they do present her as a certain erotically charged, very present, very female, slightly aloof woman. And uh, that certainly affects the way people have looked at her because they look at her from his, his photographs. This is another one he did this about in the mid 1920s. The kind of hauteur there, right? The marvelous face. And here you get a slightly different sense of her. This is a photograph taken by Ansel Adams. 
um, <clears throat> I think in the 30s, when she's uh, spending the time as she loved out in New Mexico, she had a Model A Ford, which she loved. And she rigged it out as a studio and she would drive it any which place. She'd just take some camping gear with her by herself. She would go to here to Ansel Adams with her. Um, and she'd go out and camp in, in, the, in the wilds, in the barren spots and then paint nature. So here we again, have our artists looking out at us now into a camera instead of the um, mirror, holding her whole handful of brushes. So I think what's that, the third or fourth we've seen of that. But that kind of spontaneity and that smile, I mean, she's evidently was very sociable, um, is not so, not the immediate impression you get. Whoops, someone still needs to mute. From that, or from this one. So she was lively, hearty, saucy, as well as sexy. So now we'll go back and look at some from her career. Uh, she won a prize for this when she was went to Art Students League. I mean, it's like ugh, the Monkar Art Museum has a Another version of this, it's a standard setup for still life, for the uh, students learning how to handle different textures and light on different matters. And it's just a hair and a copper pot. So it was very competently done in a very traditional manner. And she's very obliging in doing that. And then she does this a couple of years later. I don't know that they well, this is five years later. Uh, <clears throat> this is a watercolor, and this is done in, you'd say, an arts and crafts style. So she's she's adept, you know. She's working in a completely different way. Uh, if someone can identify who that is who has the needs to mute and uh, send them a note, that would be just wonderful. Now, this is not by her. I'm um, gonna show you two by this, this teacher she had, this Arthur Wesley Dow. Uh, <clears throat> this and this. The, this painting in particular looks mm, conventional, right? It's done around 1915, but it's his teaching, um, the way he had his students go about his art, their art. Uh, he, he, did, he did the otherwise unthinkable. He did not have them start by studying nature. You do not, or by studying other art, which then taught you how to study nature, and then you copy nature. He started with the abstract elements of form, with line, color, and shape. Now, Kandinsky was doing the same thing in Eastern Europe at this same time. And both of them were partly inspired by Japanese art. And both of them found the great analog was music as being an art form that was purely expressive without anything that you could peg as coming from the natural world. So they said, what is there in visual arts so that? Well, you have form, however the form, whatever it's applied to or color, or a line, or composition. So the expressive content comes from them rather than the narrative that a painting could have. So I just, I don't think, maybe I don't even need to tell you something. What he said, well, this is something from Dow, because he wrote about it too. He wrote a book so that people would be inspired by this. Art like music should be based on synthetic principles. And synthetic means putting them together. Um, that music is the key to the other fine arts because its essence is pure beauty. And art in space can be called visual music. And that is so close to the way Kandinsky was thinking at the same time. So you have O'Keefe, at least later talking about even earlier than this saying that she had things in her 
that she wanted to express an art that she knew were not like anything art uh, that, that had been. Uh, and then this teaching to sort of like loose that in her. And she begins to do charcoal drawings. This one's just called number 12. So, uh, and this will, I'll show you, Stieglitz saw this. He said, one of the finest, purest things he ever saw. Uh, in looking at it, I, I don't know, one thing I'm stuck by is that it just looks like so much fun to make this, to make this big sweeping curving lines uh, <clears throat> to play with pressing down hard and then the different ways that you're holding the chalk here. And these shapes, and especially the spiral, um, it's fun to sort of, if there's a physical pleasure in twisting your wrist around to make this. And these shapes, um, will occur sometimes in her later works of art. I mean, with a theme, this may then be a ram's horn. Uh, this may be part of a flower, but you can see the, the they really in here and her, it's not just in the things that she's seeing. And one of the notable features about them is that Unlike the abstraction at Kandinsky or European male artists were developing, that this is basically all curvilinear. And, you know, there's this standard statement, anything straight lined is abstract, man-made and artificial because there are no straight lines in nature. But curve forms express natural growth and the forms that come naturally to nature. So there's a kind, of, this is sometimes called organic abstraction because it just had, it's so different from cubism, for example. Now, this is one thing that Stieglitz loved about it because he had, especially after the, um, after um, 1913 or so, wanted to advocate for American art. It, Initially, he, he was the first to show Picasso, the first to show Cezanne, and um, in other major European ultra-modernists um, in, in his gallery in New York, but uh, he, he now wanted to encourage especially American art. And so he's going to um, especially praise and frame her work as being, she's never been to Europe, she's never studied with an a European, this is an, a, a native outgrowth um, and he and many others will call it woman's art. Here's the way that drawing was shown in, in his inexpensive little gallery called the 291 in New York. With the, the bottoms here is just covered with a, you know, sort of like a banquet table with a cloth pleated around it. He had, I think every year after 1916, he had a show of her work, if not a solo show with her in it. I mean, she had, she was a prolific, prolific artist, more than 900 paintings. And um, she really drove herself and she was shown everywhere. Uh, first woman to get a re retrospective just of her work at MoMA, for example. 1946, but here's a, another one showing how casually her, um, her work was being shown. These are more of, of her charcoal drawings in that show. This is one that the Met Museum owns and I brought it in because I wanted to read to you what is in the Met's description. The Met's, so here they said, the right side, these meandering lines suggest a flowing river or rising flames. Um, the four rounded bulbs at the center recall rolling hillside or densely foliated trees. 
and the jagged lines allude to mountain peaks or flashes of lightning. Now that's not Georgia O'Keeffe who says this. Georgia O'Keeffe is herself, was herself almost truculent about not, not wanting to explain or describe what she did. Uh, <clears throat> she got very angry sometimes at the way others described it, but, but for her, it was the image that, that spoke. And in this one, what I, when I was reading what from the mat is, of course, they say, automatically they're thinking that this has to refer to nature. Why? Why would you have to think that? You just do. And the other thing that I thought, well, oh, when they said that this could be a winding river or a flame, well, this is a winding river as if you're looking from above down. And it's a flame as if you're looking from the side on. So you're leaving left with not only ambiguity about what these objects are, but what is your relation to them? Your viewing position. Maybe what she was doing was like, mm, no, I wanna try some jagged lines. I'm gonna have real sharp contrast, erase a little bit along here. And then I think I'm gonna work on something else over here. Yeah, this looks good and I'll put it here. We don't know. This one has uh, <clears throat> done around the same time. These are 1915, 16, these drawings. Uh, and this is about um, two feet high. And this one's in the uh, Whitney. And uh, it's that theme of a spiral, which she will come back to again and again and again. And the spiral is often thought of it's sort of like the generation of life or, you know, you think of a, fern frond unfurling that life spins out from this, or you think of water moving around here. <clears throat> so that's, that's gonna be another recurring motif in her work. Um, I guess I didn't bring any more of those drawings. So, so here, even before she had, it's attached to any subject matter, you see those patterns. So she is thinking in an abstract way. Uh, here's a sunrise that she did this in 1916. She's in Texas and how totally minimal this is. Uh, later, I think maybe next time I'll read to you a quote about the coloring of this because, well, it's a wonderful pinks of the sunrise. <clears throat> but she later deplores how people identify her work as ladylike or woman's art because it uses pink. And she says, pink is a beautiful color. What does it have to do with women? You know, this is just, why can't I use pink? I mean, because women's art, of course, with the, the implication being is that that's a, a lesser art than men's art. Oh, one last of these early watercolors. She did this in 14, 1918. And when she was in Texas, a uh, flag. Her brother was stationed, just about to go to war <clears throat> nearby. And so she did this flag. Uh, she was a pacifist herself. In fact, she was happy to leave her teaching job and take Stieglitz's invitation to come live, essentially live with him in New York um, because uh, there was such disapproval of her political views where she was teaching. Well, this is what most people think of, and at least I did get to one, one, one of her flower paintings today. This is Petunias. Um, this is about, um, let's see, two and a half feet across. This is the first floral painting she did that was a, one of the enlarged views and cropped views of flowers, which become such a signature of her work in the 20s and 30s. <clears throat> so I wanna tell you a little about the genesis of this. Uh, 
then I'm not going to do other floral paintings until next next week. But, um, she she and uh, Alfred were spending the summers up at Lake Lake George, where the Stieglitz family had a sort of big <laughs> compound. And there were always gobs of people there, and uh, she, with a little of her Wisconsin farm girl background, uh, decided to set some flower borders, and she. Um, planted petunias so that she would, with their vibrant color, they would give her something to paint. Um, she, she, there were there are earlier sort of more conventional flower paintings still preserved even from back in her high school years. It's, uh, let me just give you that part I can. She said, she said uh, her high school teacher taught her to pay attention to flowers and that it was important to study them from all angles. So you get a sense of her saltiness, I think a little bit, her strength of character in this fairly long section that I'm gonna to read to you about something she said about flowers. A flower is relatively small. Everyone has associations with the flower, the idea of flowers. You put out your hand to touch the flower Lean forward to smell it. Maybe touch it with your lips without thinking or give it to someone to please them. Still, in a way, nobody sees a flower, really. It's so small. We haven't time and it takes time, like to have a friend take time. So I said to myself, I'll paint what I see, what the flower is to me, but I'll paint it big and they will be surprised into taking time to look at it. I will make even busy New Yorkers take time to see what I see of flowers. Well, I made you take time to look at what I saw. And when you took time to really notice my flower, you hung all your own associations with flowers on my flower. And you write about my flower as if I see and think what you think and see of the flower. And I don't. So that's all I'm going to say about, it. oh, well, no, one more comment I heard about flowers, and then we're going to defer flowers till next week. <clears throat> Here's something else she said about flowers. Uh, I paint them because they're cheaper than models and they don't move. So you see, <laughs> she's, she's quite slippery. <laughs> yeah, she's not going to necessarily reveal herself. And there's a kind of a double entendre when I said that. Instead, what we have from their summers in Lake George is this one called My Shanty. It's a Phillips collection in Washington, DC. And I dare say, unless you're quite familiar with, uh, with her work, you would not peg this as being by Georgia O'Keeffe. And let's say you looked up here at the line of the clouds, the shape, the very gradual shift in shading here, or possibly the contour, the subtle curves of that. That looks a little bit like her. But this building, this straight on view, this geometry of it, this simple areas of color, flat color here, the um, kind of, absence of human behavior in this <clears throat> suggests something else entirely. Uh, the shanty was actually a place that meant something to her. This is a, was an old dance hall that she uh, renovated uh, because it was just too chaotic in the Stieglitz household. So she went there to paint. Uh, supposedly Alfred could come there and work too, but mainly she did. And so although she's largely painting flower paintings there, she did do this. Now, why did she do this? Well, she's reacting to all the male criticism of her work. They didn't understand her flower paintings and those curvilinear works, those ladylike works. And she didn't like the painting. She did not like Cezanne. She did not like post-impressionism. But she did not want to be put down as being unable to do what those men were doing. 
So she's here, it's like a test case. She's a proof that she's showing that she can paint a masculine painting, that it has all the rigor and all the solidity and all the rectilinearity and all the simplification that male precisionist paintings were doing at this time. So she's fighting so hard to be defined just as an artist, not as a woman artist, not as a male artist. She just wants to do what she wants to do so that she'll do this and then move on. So the moving on that I'm going to show you, we just in this last few minutes are her, um, go, go to her architectural painting she did in New York in the 20s. First, this is by Charles Sheeler, her contemporary, um, Barnes in um, Pennsylvania. You see that same, so she said, yeah, I can do it. And she does do that for a while in the city. Uh, she does a number of paintings. Um, she and, and Stieglitz lived on 49th Street and she started painting what she could see out her window and then doing some more in the city. Um, in the mood of the 20s and early 30s was this kind of like buoyant enthusiasm about um, New York as the city of the future. But this is a time when skyscrapers are developing and this is just like the, this moving on and this kind of like view, this kind of, you even get the sense of speed when you look up at an angle like this. Now, she got this partly from photography because she knew what avant, was going on in avant-garde photography. And there were other precisionist painters working like this too. But this is the first one she did. It's got New York City with the moon. City night. All bits of nature intruding in here. Um, I could direct you to many European painters working. This is a kind of a universal style of the mid 1920s. Art Deco style. This one's really interesting. Um, the East River. The subtlety with which she's, the gradations in the color, of course, that's what she's gonna do with the flower paintings too, but it's, that's again, it's part of her rather than just of the flower. And probably the best known one is this, the radiator building. Uh, it's at the, in the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas now. Spends two years there and it spends two years at the Fisk University. They, they share this uh, bequest from the Stieglitz collection. So here, now look, these are forms. You're gonna see those in flowers, these kind of frilled forms. Of course, here it's smoke. Something like this you're gonna find in flowers too. So I just remind you, this is, this is her expression of what's, I don't even know how you say this, it, 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 other than that that's, that's, that's just in her, as that these are our forms. And then there's a, some sort of searchlight in the distance, this great beam of light coming this way. And here's the radiator building. And it's right across from Bryant Park. It was a brand new skyscraper at the time. So. To this. I, I'm just too good. It's exactly two o'clock and this is a good place to stop because we're gonna get into something that's gonna bring up a lot of conversation or question next time, because we're gonna get into the whole issue of the ascription 
of uh, female sexuality, that she's celebrating female sexuality in her paintings, which she, throughout her life, as much as stood on a soapbox and said, I am not. But what you say doesn't have to be necessarily what's true. Okay, so I'm going to stop the screen share and linger around for any questions or comments. I have a comment. Um, yeah. Let me just, okay. I, I wanted people to know that if they put their mouse on the screen and go to the top of the screen when you're showing when you're showing your slides, you can enlarge portions. So you can see it up closer if you have trouble seeing. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. How far up on your screen? It only works when you have a slide on. Okay. Right now. Okay, but, I'll have to try that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Joy here. I can't yes, wait yes. till next week. <laughs> okay, so I was thinking about you. Are you are you a flower person or the Mex New Mexico person? Which do you, I, do you like them all? I love it all. I I I love her work. I just love it. Oh, okay. Look at it forever. But then I'd miss everybody else's work too. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie. A uh, question, are you able to read the chat that come in as you're going along or should well, we? Well, you know, I probably could, but I get so carried away looking at these images that I don't even notice it. <laughs> okay, I understand, but I just wanted to say thank you. It's been very enlightening. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and I can always yeah. look at the chat now too. I see there's six comments in chat, in fact. Um, um. Can't see this place, see Maggie, yeah, blah. Top of the tree reminds me of squirrels. Yes, indeed. Okay, more, 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 more. Maggie, how large were those uh, Rachel Royce's um, flower paintings, the still lifes? Were they small or? This high. What's that, a foot? Two? The, the, the flowers would be, I guess, about life-size flowers, almost. Okay, thank you. So I think they must have been by, like, like buying the most expensive handbag nowadays for a woman, you know, to get one. To have a Roish in, in your collection was really, for the ultra rich, that was the thing to have. Maggie, I just wondered whether she was the only still life flower painter who put oh, insects no. in, no. put no. insects almost, and newts and almost, things almost, like that. No, I think they all do. Oh. Because that's part of that whole theme about the transience of life. This is not uh -huh. just your hedonist, enjoy the flowers. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. This is the kind of, you know, yeah. Okay, what else? Why did you jump from the 1600s to the 1800s? <laughs> Well, you know, I think the next series, I'm going to go back and do gods and goddesses. And then the series after that, I'm going to have to do women artists again. Because we're just not going to get to all these marvelous 20th century female artists. It was because there's not enough time. And I am I made the decision that rather than saying, okay, here are five of this person and five of this person and six of this person, that here, get to know this person, get to know this person. And actually, this would be really helpful to me if you would rather um, sometimes have me go the other way around so that you have a kind of a general sense of the lay of the land of them, let me know and I'll, I'll, I can do that like more thumbnail presentations on different people. So think about it, you don't have to answer right now, but that would be so helpful to me. Maggie, the painting of the uh, radiator building, uh -huh. it has a, um, a red line to the left yes. of the picture. Now, is that, or is that supposed to be a representation of sunset or sunrise? It's, I have no idea. And I was wondering, too, why it doesn't continue on to the other side. Is it supposed to be that the... I have the, no idea. 
I'm yeah. thinking, is that is that a neon sign on the top of another building? I don't know. I thought you'd have it absolute for me. Of course, don't you see what it is? <laughs> you're, you're guessing as well. Very, very, very. Very nice, all the same. Any more? Well. Thank you very much. Well, enjoy your week and prepare we'll go out. If, you know, I really, it's too bad I just, didn't know I should have called it differently and done the desert scenes today, given this weather. It'd be nice to look at something <laughs> sunny and arid and <laughs> all this weather. Okay, next week. And, and also Al, um, Alice Neal next week. Goodbye. Thank you, Maggie. Bye.